Welcome to Epicenter, the hub of innovation in the heart of Helsinki, where ideas come to life and creativity thrives, where innovation meets community. Get ready to learn, network, and make an impact. Let's go. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> we're starting. I don't know, my mic wouldn't work there. It was a little odd. How are we today? Good, you're here. Avoiding the beautiful weather to spend time with me. I appreciate that so much. Um, I know that almost everyone in this building uh, has been to an Epicenter event before. So you know who I am. I'm Joey. I'm the head of community here at Epicenter Helsinki. Um, I guess it's my due diligence to read a little bit about what we are, <laughs> even though there are so many here who know us. So uh, you, as you know, Epicenter is a playground and a meeting arena for local change makers uh, to come together uh, to innovate um, hotspots and supercharge their local entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, we support this by creating a safe space and, and a physical space where networking, knowledge sharing, and collaboration act as a platform for the acceleration of innovation and growth, which seems all too pertinent for the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, with this, we also help our communities uh, create the workspace of the future. So basically all of this means is that what we do is we bring brilliant people together to share ideas, to network, and to grow. Are we ready to do that today? Yeah? Okay. So as you all know, you see, I, you know why I know that you've been here is because you're clapping and you're screaming at me. So you know that we spend the first 10 seconds of every community event and we clap for ourselves. Uh, so we're going to keep doing that. And today I can't join you because my hands are full with a mic and uh, some cue cards. But uh, you'll have to scream extra loud for me, okay? So for the first 10 seconds, please give yourself a huge round of applause. <laughs> and whistles, too. How did I get so lucky? Okay, so innovation thrives when ideas from various fields, industries, and ways of thinking merge. Building this future is a big task, causing industries and fields of studies to be reimagined to make way for new opportunities. We're all familiar with the game-changing revolution, uh, revolutions Industry 4.0 is introducing, from smart factories to the Internet of Things, but today we will go deeper. We're going to explore a pivotal concept at the heart of this revolution, convergence. Uh, so tonight we're going to feature three keynotes and one panel. Uh, the first uh, will be an introduction to convergent reality, and um, this is going to explain what it is, why it matters, and how it's shaping our world. Uh, next, we'll shift gears uh, to the world of automotives, uh, discovering how convergence is changing the industry's game in our keynote, Convergence in the Automotive Industry. Uh, and after that, we're going to delve into the journey of a, a ceramics artist and designer who encounters convergence through first-hand experience. So, and then finally, we're going to bring it all together, and we're going to have our panel discussion about uh, convergent creative collaboration. So here we're going to learn more about exciting ways convergence is driving innovation across various fields. How does that sound for a full day of, or not a full day, a full afternoon of, uh, <laughs> of chatting? Does that sound good? Yeah? Okay. And then, as a, as a surprise, not as a surprise, as a, as a reward, you'll have some tapas and more drinks. I'm great at giving out extra drink tickets if you ever need one. That's how I've made all of my friends here in Helsinki. <laughs> okay, let's begin. Are we ready to begin? Okay. Perfect. So, um, our first keynote address is uh, someone that I see very regularly. <laughs> and he has become a great friend. So our first keynote address comes from a dynamic, multilingual, multicultural co-founder of startups in sectors including language tech, invest tech, and legal tech. With over three decades of experience in the creative industries worldwide, uh, founder of Convergent Reality, um, he has introduced a new field of study dedicated to increasing human capacity for perceiving new and emergent realities. Uh, in 2022, uh, Dominique was selected to participate in the 90-day FIN program organized by Helsinki Partners and uh, the city of Helsinki. Um, we're just having a bunch of technical problems today. Um, unsure what, what happened there, but 
I'm going to jump off stage, let Dominique come up and uh, tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. Good afternoon and early evening. My name is Dominique Morales, and I am the founder of Convergent Reality. It is a real privilege to be here this afternoon with you to share in what I think in short time you will learn is actually a historic day. Let's say um, at the level of global interest, convergence has peaked. If you're unfamiliar with convergence and thereby unfamiliar with convergent reality, I'm going to share with you both the etymology of the word of convergence, so we understand a little bit what we're talking about, and also the work that we're doing at Convergent Reality. Now, how is it possible that sitting in this room with you know, just the people that we know and friends and colleagues that we are actually experiencing a historic moment? Well, at the end of my presentation, I'd like to share some news with you which was just published last night about the field of convergence by one of the largest nation states in the world. So if you can find it within the late afternoon to stay until the end of my presentation, it will become extraordinarily relevant, not only to you, your companies, your communities, but also Finland as a nation. So let me kick off. So convergent reality, as Joey stated, is dedicated to increasing human capacity for perceiving new and emergent realities developing emergent systems and environments, implementing cognitive augmentation tools to maximize creativity and transform human collaboration. Now, it's gonna be mentioned again later, so you can start to process this as an introduction. And in our recent activities, we have also been able to converge people in this community from various sectors, which I'll get to a little bit later. But before we do that, let's just get to some of the other global players who've been talking about and working on convergence so that you get it's not just me. Now, uh, in a recent MIT technology review, Daniel, Daniela Rus, professor and CCL director at MIT, and Kathleen O'Reilly, Communications, Media, and Technology Industry Group Chair at Accenture, have made some fairly bold statements. As you can see at the bottom, Kathleen O'Reilly states, this convergence will be the biggest change since the Industrial Revolution. And Daniela Rus refers to convergence as a historic opportunity. So as leading voices within both academia and the world of technology, it is critical that we now begin to understand not only the premise of convergence, but its impact on Industry 4.0. Truly, we can say from what we're seeing here at a very early stage of public communications that convergence will be the leading framework for Industry 4.0. Now, bringing this a little bit closer to home, around the time that Convergent Reality became a company, and a few months before that, um, I myself had spent approximately 15 years working up to the moment to make our work public. And I began doing that around December, and around January, we formed a global team of advisors from various sectors to provide us with expert insights on how we could do our work in an ethical way, in an inclusive way, and a human-centric way. January, Tampere University received three million euros to create an entire postdoctoral team to study convergence. And so to give you an idea of the areas of study, and some of these might be relevant to you. For example, convergence is being studied at Tampere University as it applies to effective computing, gamification. Anyone in the gaming industry here today? Please raise your hand. There we go, very good. 
visualization, cybernetics. Anyone here involved in cybernetics? Nope. Oh, one, yes. My apologies, it's a little bit dark and the light is coming directly into my pupil, so kind of hard to see, yeah. All right, so ubiquitous connectivity, which we're actually all in that, dispersed computing, AI and machine learning, every single one of us is participating in today, and robotics, and the last of which is truly challenging to accept is machine perception. So, these are the areas currently that this team of PhD students, of which there are 16, are now dedicated over these coming years to studying in the field of convergence. So what we know is that Convergent Reality is effectively the first privately held company in Finland to be focused on developing systems and environments specifically intended for and with the framework of convergence. That intention to serve individuals, companies, communities, and nation states in traversing this ever increasingly changing landscape of accelerationism in technology. Oops, there we go. Hello, anybody? That's all right. So when I say that convergent reality is committed to increasing human capacity for perceiving new and emergent realities, what does that muster in your imagination? Is there anyone who has any idea what that actually means? Any hands? So perhaps we can consider, and this is gonna get a little bit farther, but let me go down here, uh, meh, meh, nope. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so within this study, we're also going to um, learn what I'm gonna share with you now, which is effectively that our brain averages everything. Let's say we see 100 apples, by somewhere around the 15th apple, all of the apples look the same size. Why do we do that? Because the manner in which we perceive reality has to have some kind of predictable order for us to actually sequence and become real. If we saw the apples all 100 as they actually are, the cognitive load or the amount of energy that would be required to actually take in and process, perceive, and create a new frame of reference for those individual apples would be like your computer melting down. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the etymology. So what is etymology? It's like the history of a word. Where does it come from? Well, convergence is not a new word. Convergence actually is derived from, or at least in the English version, um, or its current version, sometime in the 1690s or the late 17th century, this word, con, which is an updated version of the Latin word com, which means with, combined with vergere, or in the German pronunciation of the Latin vergere, we end up getting to, which is con, with, and vergere, which means to lean in the direction of, or have a tendency toward. You can simplify it by thinking of convergence as two things, separate and independent, coming together to form something unique and new that hasn't existed before. Now, Oh dear. How we then define convergent reality is more for the sake of, let's say, looking at the reality that a human perceives within both physical and virtual worlds, but consider that the brain doesn't know the difference between the two. Oftentimes we're tricked by what we see in virtual reality or augmented reality and those experiences are also real experiences for us. And yet, at the moment, they're quite siloed by the hardware required to experience synthetic environments and the fact that we don't really distinguish that this is both real 
in physical life and in virtual life. So convergent reality is an emerging discipline, and I talked to you a little bit about what we're committed to there. How is it different then from, let's say, and actually, Michael, where is Michael? Introduce yourself. Michael asked me, oh, is convergent reality like VR or AR? So let's have a distinction. How is convergent reality different from AR or VR? Well, I mentioned a little bit, convergent reality transcends existing visual and audio-driven interactive interfaces. So let's say that VR is constrained by a device. You have to wear something on your head to experience VR. But you can actually begin to perceive new and emergent reality simply out from language that doesn't require a device. So we're actually equipped with a highly sophisticated processor that can achieve perceiving reality newly without a headset. Convergent reality promotes the active integration of emotional, psychological, and physiological experience of participants in digital environments, forming a continuous singular memory and fluidity of cognitive perception. So what does that mean? Well, it means that from here in the physical life to here in the digital life, there is a seamless continuity in the manner in which we perceive both realities. Convergent reality allows people to experience a newly formed perception of their occurring world, composed of events that are independent or concurrent in both physical and digital environments. So in reality, what this looks like, I will show you in just a couple slides, but one of our advisors is a strategic communications professional. I asked him, what do you think convergent reality is? How would you define it? How would you express it from your point of view? And he said, CR is a field of study and a lens for inquiry that encompasses the very way humans perceive the world and the ongoing evolution of that perception. So how many in the audience today believe that we are finished in the evolution of the human brain? Let's see. Are we finished? Is it complete? Is, is the system brain 1.0 done? <laughs> hope not. So there is hope. And certainly we can have a little bit of a history conversation at one point about at which point in history did your brain take its current form? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Anyone? Nope, okay. If you come up to me later, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. And then let's say on the academia side, we start to see the emergence of conversations around convergent reality, which are taking form within different sectors. Paul Savage is one of our advisors. He's from Alto University. And I asked him, Paul, what is it that you believe is convergent reality? He said, convergent reality is an expression that posits a permanent present space and time constantly unfolding where there is a coming together of an actual world or worlds and virtual worlds. Oh, oh well, he's gone. And then he talks about embodiment. So Paul has been working on a paper that will be published and presented in Greece based on convergent reality in the coming month in June. So I'm just sharing with you kind of a broad sector, broad swatch of different people's interpretation of what is convergent reality and why it's important. And I think what was gonna come next is about our most recent activities to give you kind of a real world example of this. Yeah, there it is. So over the past weekend, over three days time, we decided to create what effectively was a conference, hackathon, and series of workshops focused around convergent reality. And we chose the creative industry as the sector that we wanted to focus on, utilizing convergent reality as a framework to generate solutions for those challenges which we are facing in the creative industry. So let's say some of those were challenges around how now with ChatGPT do we effectively create value distribution models, authorship attribution models that actually serve the creators? How is it that we can design a kind of tree of influence to understand, given this 
referential database spit out new version of all of the work that's been scraped to produce it, can we actually understand who influenced the output itself? And so um, we created this, uh, this event. And I was surprised that throughout the course of the weekend, several solutions emerged that really provided us with an insight to both how technologists see creative industries and how creatives perceive technology. And bringing those communities together under the same roof has now led to us being granted a facility where we will be able to build what is effectively our assembly line. So this is the first physical Web3 assembly line and the manner in which it's designed is hands-on. You see in station one, the artisan would experience, let's say, for example, a scanning process followed by authorship attribution and value distribution, followed by customized frames or templates to present their work, optimization, storytelling, and digital marketing that leads directly into marketplaces. So the XR Center in Helsinki has granted us a space that's approximately 100 meters squared, and we'll be building this assembly line there. It actually has only happened in the past week and a half, and it will be opening on this Thursday. So everyone here tonight is most welcome to join us and see in real life what we're actually doing and how it looks, so you can get a tangible way of wrapping your mind around what is convergent reality and how does it apply. Later you're going to hear from someone in the automotive industry that's responsible for designing the first digital convergent system and this assembly line will also be used in that project for the automotive industry. So before we go, and Joey, do you want to give me an idea of how much time we have left? Oh, we're over. All right. So I'm not going to read this entire statement, but what I did want to share with you here at the end, if you've not familiarized yourself with the field of convergence and you're unfamiliar, today is probably the best day to do it. Why? And this is not a sales pitch. I would just like to presence that last night, one of the largest nation states in the world published a 132-page plan for the era of convergence that might not sound or seem significant, but with the resources that this nation state has, the impact will be felt globally with certainty across all of your businesses, across supply chain, across technological acceleration. We're going to see this play out globally. And what I hope is that maybe by being here, it's a signal of your interest in a topic that may be new and emergent for you, but by the end of this evening, it will inspire you to look further into the field of convergence, how, as a framework, it can serve you in your industry, in your companies, communities, and in your nation. So I've gone well over, but thank you very much for your time. You can reach me at Dominique at ConvergentReality.o. Thank you very much. Can you go to the next slide? Let's give a huge round. I am so sorry for, for no worries. that. That's uh, my uh, sweat stains are <laughs> hidden under this shirt. Uh, uh, well, thank you, thank you. Give, let's give a huge round of applause for for Dominique. Okay, so uh, he's going to join us back on stage for our panel discussion. But next, I'd like to bring on stage uh, Ghana Born, founder of a software company based in Washington, D.C., uh, having designed and built uh, Origo's uh, software digital conference or convergence platform, Gazelle. Uh, Isaac has led the industry in providing convergence solutions to large organizations like uh, the San Francisco airport, uh, introducing cloud computing and creating an integrated integrated uh, digital transformation uh, map for SFOIT. Uh, Isaac also uh, participated in the 90 Day Fin program in fall of 2022 and is a co-founder of the first convergent automotive solutions provider, Mobility Automotive. Please, let's welcome to the stage, Isaac. Thank 
check. One, two. Is my mic on? <laughs> yep. Yep. Can you guys hear me? I got to turn. There we are. Okay. Here we go. So we'll start out with a brief history of uh, computing and work our way through Origo Software's uh, digital convergence story. Um, back in the mainframe days, we used to connect up data uh, using sp specialized programs through things we call batch jobs. Because in those days, the mainframes were particularly focused on specific tasks. Uh, so if you needed to connect up data uh, to figure out analytics on what your customers were experiencing and how to make decisions for the company and how you, you, you basically change your operations to improve, you needed to build specific programs to stitch up your data. They had IT departments, had uh, folks that were dedicated to this kind of activity. And then came the client server era where specific systems were built around data. And we came to recognize databases uh, like the oracles of the world and so on that specialized in bringing that data together inside platforms so you could do that stitching a lot easier. And in addition to that, they gave you tools for doing your reporting and analytics. But that was still slow uh, and not very uh, convenient in terms of being able to build uh, uh, data systems that would respond quickly to customer demands and management, right? So manag managers wanted to be able to get answers to questions quickly. If problems were happening in su uh, supply chains and so on, they wanted to be able to get to that data. So it was really hard to harvest that data. But what we also noticed was that um, as these systems got bigger and there was more and more data, it was harder to solve these problems. We enter the age of cloud computing around the 2000s. We are experiencing aspect orientation. We're seeing microservices. And these new services are smaller, more specialized, more sophisticated by, by, by all means, but still creating huge, huge amounts of data. So around that time, you start seeing um, uh, specific technologies like data hubs and data lakes being created and built just to support the activities for introspecting your data and bringing out intelligence so you could make your operations smoother and, again, supporting customer demands at the end of the day, all right? Um, around the 2010s, we start seeing what we believe are the early convergence platforms. So one example I'll give is WeChat, where you have a ton of applications sitting on one platform that's being used by millions of people and providing a lot of real convenience to users. Uh, a system like Salesforce is another example where you have the capability for enterprises to build the applications faster and faster than ever, right? And we've been doing research about how to stitch together systems and stitch together applications, and most importantly, stitch together meaning for your information so that these questions can be answered faster and faster. Uh, and being able to provide solutions to your customers that are extremely relevant to their problem faster than ever. So around the, uh, 2012, we came up with uh, an architecture framework called DCAF, the Digital Convergence Architecture Framework. Uh, we also supported that with a convergence theory that basically states that as systems get larger and your data becomes more expanded and so on, your approach and how you deal with your data so that you can introspect faster and build more relevance in the questions that your data answers uh, has to be a little different. And you have to use an atomic approach, or what we call an atomic approach. Well, today you're seeing things like LLMs, like ChatGBT, uh, using tokens as atomic components of data, uh, or at atomic aspects for content representation, right? Uh, so it's been at least 20 years since we started looking at those things. Uh, to, to now, uh, where we're actually seeing it, and we're seeing the power of it in the world. So this describes our digital convergence architecture framework, we, which we proved out to be extremely effective for transforming an enterprises. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what we mean when we say that. 
but this framework basically takes any enterprise application or any enterprise uh, uh, environment and divides it into three areas or three factors, what we call operational factors, transformational factors, and dimensional factors. And you can model this pretty much after any business operation or business challenge or solution space, right? You've got your inputs, which are your business demands and objectives of the problems that you're trying to solve or the questions that you're trying to ask of your data and your catalogs or the way you're storing your data. They go into this machine here, and uh, you actually have your dimensional factors, which are the actions around that data or your business. Uh, you've got to have some governance, which are your rules that you use to uh, control your business environment. You've got patterns. These are activities that your people use to operate the business. And resources. Um, uh, this could be you know, your software or, or, or components, procedures, and so on. And those are all dimensions that control your business environment. The point of convergence sits in the middle, and we represent that as APIs because we like to think of everything that is intelligent that's being created and used inside the enterprise ought to be exposed as an API. If you look at the success of AWS, that's a primal example of success using APIs and exposing your intelligence to the world as a, an augmented business posture. And then transformational factors deal with things that you want to see coming out of your, your business model. So you're talking about agility, insights, if you want to disrupt the market, the things that you want to ask of your systems to be able to do those disruptions, if you want to keep innovating, and continuous, things like continuous improvement and maturity. Now the convergence happens as you see a circular flow of disc discovery, ev evolution, configuration, and adaptation around these inputs and outputs. And the understanding here is that as these things happen, this model actually can move and tell you how your, your environment is behaving in its natural state. And you can put pressure points across these axes in different places for you to get different kinds of results. But this is how digital convergence happens in reality. And we've taken this model and applied it to several industries and have proven how effective it is and how quickly you can build solutions and put them into the market. Uh, we were in a position to provide a healthcare platform in South America uh, to cover a whole country. And we were able to provide that solution within a month using these, these same ideas. Uh, we're also in a position to provide uh, a solution across the United States for over 30 million uh, phone subscribers, and that solution was also built and designed within a month, and we were in production in less than three months for that solution, and it actually served uh, for several years uh, for that business model. So we've proven it in the marketplace, and it works. Now, we turn our focus to mobility as a service. Uh, we are currently seeing a huge commitment towards EVs, the car is now a data, basically a data and energy asset, right? Uh, it has the ability to pull a lot of data, uh, but we're also in a place where the data collection ca uh, capabilities are going to go beyond just what's provided in the car, and actually the human aspect of it, we can start pulling data. So people's preferences and how they use their cars is changing, and we're able to pull that data. People want to see more immersive and experiential uh, ex uh, services with their cars, right, and very personalized. So the approach in how we provide vehicles to people uh, is, is, is transforming. We also see in our research approaching net zero operation with possible energy surplus over the next few years. So cars are actually going to be running and not having to stop and charge, but you can actually get home at the end of your day and plug in your car and possibly uh, have a surplus energy going back in your home. Uh, we also want to uh, see integrated applications for management, control, and entertainment. The, 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 the dashboards in your vehicles are becoming more and more sophisticated, and the entertainment capabilities are being integrated faster than ever. We're also seeing vehicle ownership models are changing. Not everyone want, now wants to buy a car. We were just having a conversation earlier with someone that does not want to buy a car anymore, and they're just, just using uh, a, rent, a rental, right? 
Um, and then we also see in this trend in the future, people are going to want to have more personalized vehicle designs, localized assembly, and delivery. All right, so potentially you could go to your service shop, order your vehicle, and it shows up in a shorter amount of time. We also see recycling, opportunities for recycling of materials and waste management. What are we going to do with all these engines, all these uh, ICE vehicles uh, out there? There's going to be huge business opportunities for recycling and managing all that and making it work for us in a cyclical economy. In terms of our relationship with convergence, uh, convergent reality, um, we see advances in sensory data acquisition. Um, your car is going to get to know you a lot closer and utilize that information that it knows of you on a personal basis. Right now, AI is really focused on general data sets that are found and fed into these learning models. But with the advancement of chips, AI-focused AI chips, uh, we're actually going to see AI systems that are personalized. So you can have your own AI, that's a, a twin, that understands how you use your vehicle, how you use the things around you to give you a better immersive experience. We're going to see that journey experiences are more immersive and transformational because of that. So some real world examples of outcomes that we expect to see. Job related stress. We've heard of stories where people that are driving new trucks that are electric are coming home a lot less stressed than they are when they were driving uh, ICE vehicles. There are cases where people are afraid of travel. So for example, someone that's afraid of climbing bridges when they're driving might have a completely different immersive experience when they go on a bridge. And the car is going to be able to change the environment and the situation that you're driving in so that your stress levels are lower and actually more enjoyable. We see changes in our manufacturing and R&D where uh, we're finding more collective information that's being provided by different users impacts how research and development is done uh, for the development of components that go into cars and overall in the cars themselves. And one important fact here is the integration of futures and anticipatory factors in our thinking in what cars look like. With CR, there's a huge opportunity to combine what people want to see in their future what they want to see with these vehicles, what they want to see in terms of regulation, safety, bias, and so on with cars. And we can actually combine those, that kind of thinking and those, those um, ideas into what the future vehicle looks like. All right, thank you very much. Let's give him a huge round of applause. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sorry about that as well. No I think I've fixed it now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, our last keynote speaker is a Finnish uh, ceramicist and a design professional. Her design style is very Scandinavian, clean and elegant. While living abroad for 15 years, her ceramic designs often cherished her Nordic roots. With a master's degree in business, she is initially a self-taught ceramicist, but in 2017 to 2020, she studied at Harvard Ceramics Program in Boston. As she is fascinated by porcelain as a raw material, she also enjoys the versatility of the process, whether a soft chunk of clay gets transformed into a gold adorned unique work of art or piece of jewelry. Uh, help me give a huge round of applause for uh, Mia. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We should have had, instead of my face, we should have had a piece of my work here, but it is what it is. So I'll keep this very short because my, my um, knowledge about convergent reality at this stage is still very, very limited, so I, I will not speak as long as uh, the, the, the other speakers. Uh, but basically, um, in addition to being a ceramicist, I, I'm, direct, I'm the director of Design District Helsinki, which is, is an, it's an association of um, creative uh, businesses in Helsinki. And that was uh, why I initially came to this, um, this collaboration, 
to, to get an idea if there was potential for uh, Helsinki-based businesses and creative people and artisans and artists to, uh, to, to, to benefit, uh, to, to find some new channels and new ways of promoting their work, selling their work. So basically to, to enter a, a, new, a new space and um, so that I would then know what I'm talking about, <laughs> I, I joined um, this collaboration as, as an independent artist myself, which, which was uh, a convenient uh, way in this case to, to, uh, to discover what, what are the possibilities of convergent reality. And, uh, and then to, to, get a, to get an idea of, of how this could benefit other, other creative people. Um, and so I was happy to participate in the, the hackathon event uh, at Maria 01 uh, last weekend. And it was very, very, very interesting. And, um, and I was happy to, to also uh, be a, a bad example of, of an artist in the sense that, or my piece was a bad example so that it didn't quite work the well, uh, work as well as, or, or the way it was supposed to work. So there was like these, um, uh, you know, like they say that you, you learn more from your bad work than from your good work. So I was happy to be the, the, the that bad example in this case. But anyway, uh, so I, I think there is an interesting potential in, in, in this uh, universe uh, of convergent reality uh, where, where people can see your work in, in 3D in different contexts. So, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how, what direction this this will go to, and and what kind of um, yeah, what kind of opportunities um, I will discover through this uh, collaboration? That's basically all I have to <laughs> say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, huge round of applause. Please, you can join us uh, if you'd like to have a seat. We're going to okay. begin. We're going to begin Excellent. the panel. Please, anywhere you'd like. Thank you. And now, welcome back to the stage, uh, Dominique and Isaac. Give them a round of applause. Come on, they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit here. It's the worst camera angle. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so first, thank you all so much uh, for being here today. I think... Uh, oh, look, did you, did you know? Look behind you. Oh, we are in the order. Oh, how lovely. Uh, <laughs> I hope someone takes a picture. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you all so much we'll for go. being here. Uh, the high speed acceleration of technology in recent months has created an environment of urgency, um, placing increased demand on generating innovative solutions quickly in all industrial sectors. Uh, in the face of these challenges, organizations in both the public and private sectors are being pushed to innovate faster than ever before uh, with greater efficiency. Uh, through this, convergence has emerged as a, both a necessary framework uh, uh, and effective methodology, methodology for uh, generating meaningful solutions. So, all of that <laughs> said, as just to lay the groundwork, uh, I, I want to, uh, so all of that said that it suggests that interdisciplinary um, collaboration is key to innovation, right? So what role does convergence play in collaboration across uh, different departments? I'll take that one first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to give a real life example over the course of this weekend, as I kind of referenced earlier, um, we were able to bring together people from various sectors who may or may not normally interact with one another. Now this is a kind of microcosm of what might occur also within, let's say, a large corporate organization where oftentimes departments are very siloed. There are innumerable programs, facilitators, coaches, and so on, whom help organizations to bring people from disparate departments to quote unquote team build and or collaborate. And I think that all those those, although those are in many cases helpful and perhaps do move the needle, convergence actually becomes part of 
a framework, an actual view that one can take on the occurring world that breaks down those silos to begin with. Let me give you an example. So in the case of um, the Lincoln Lab at MIT, the Lincoln Lab and the Department of Defense in the United States found that this framework of convergence actually accelerated, and as Isaac referred to earlier in the systems that he also built, provided enormous cost and time efficiencies. As we all know, and I think, I don't know if anyone can feel this as well, but I pretty much wake up every single morning with a bit of anxiety wondering just how many new advances have we made overnight? What sector has another 10,000 people fired? Um, in recent times, uh, you know, British communications as well as other large corporates have seen massive layoffs, massive firings, and they have emphatically stated that the reason is because these individuals can be replaced by what is effectively a sophisticated referential database. And so um, in terms of creative collaboration and convergence, convergence is really providing an access to or a way of perceiving collaboration in and of itself as a more human-centric type of activity. I think we can all agree that we've traveled a long way away from that. It's very hard to find scenarios, especially in organizations today, and large organizations in particular, where there is truly a culture of collaboration. So I'm going to stop there, otherwise I'll talk the whole entire <laughs> hour. But, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So when people, things, ideas and information come together, convergence happens. And convergence always happens because of a notion for a demand for something. In the case you just, uh, the example you just gave, uh, perhaps speed for solutioning. Uh, when those things happen, those things come together, and you have efficient ways of measuring and attributing around those things. You can build on that convergence that's happening to create solutions faster, all right? So I think the big realization that is happening now is the fact that we have environments and systems that allow us to introspect our data better than we ever have before. The data has always been there. Yes, it's compounding and it's growing all the time. Uh, and its implications, so you gave an example of, you know, because of smarter data systems, jobs are may, may be at stake or the information that we're getting through our phones and, you know, and so on is always scaling up and so on. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing smarter and smarter tools that allow us to filter through those things. And in, some ca in the case of uh, industry, I believe that the smarter companies or organizations are not really looking at repurposing their people. I mean, are not looking at getting rid, rid of their people, they're looking at repurposing and reskilling and retooling their people to do smarter things so that they can always be ahead. Uh, this notion of convergence is not going that way. It's, the, it's really always been the foundation of industry four but it's a matter of who's really understanding how it works and how they're using it to their advantage. Yeah, you know, I mean, while that we're sort of learning and growing to to understand this, can can uh, across the panel can we share some examples of where the convergence of ideas from different industries or discipline has led to significant breakthroughs? Hmm. Yeah, so I think, um, as I mentioned before, one really uh, easy example and one that you can easily find online today. Um, either by reading the technology review with MIT um, or just simply searching Lincoln Lab and U.S. Department of Defense, it's a very real example, and I think that uh, you know that kind of sets up a very easy to understand way of looking at convergence and seeing how it's not just the same old interdisciplinary collaboration. There really is an underpinning of human-centered or human-centric creative collaboration that is emerging out from that. So perhaps 
uh, kind of leaning toward or in the direction of less reliance on technologies to do that thing or to generate that thing that is so unique between human beings. One significant example I can give is what we saw happen in the healthcare industry with COVID and all the research that came together so quickly for the development of vaccines, right? Um, there, there was so much talk about, you know, how long that was going to take and, and how developing traditional uh, vaccines, uh, you know, the, the, the time required to test and, 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 and get, you know, approvals and so on. But within a matter of years, we stepped up to it and we did it. And it's only because people decided to converge, mm -hmm. not only on the ideas, but set a target for a solution in a certain amount of time, and then agreed on how it needed to be done and shared all the data that needed to happen to make it happen. So that's a really good example of industry coming together and governments coming together and people coming together uh, to follow a line from a demand to an outcome and then you know, followed everyone converging together, the ideas and the research and the knowledge and the data and so on to make it happen. And Mia, from the creative space, where, where do you see how have, have you know, different convergences? Well, I think uh, uh, artists on one hand are so far away from, from tech people to begin with that, that uh, for, for many creative people, it's, it's unimaginable to, to um, you know, even even setting up a web shop or things like that are very uh, you know time consuming and and many feel that I'm not tech savvy enough to do something like that. So so um, it, when there are good teams that come together, um, it's it's really um, it can bring tremendous value to creative industry. I mean, we're very close to technology, let's say perhaps in our roles and the work that we do. And over the past weekend, I got to see artists, I think one of the gentlemen, he was probably in his 60s, he'd never experienced VR before in his life. Mm -hmm. And having had that experience, he immediately started creating new possibilities. So it's not just that we have some kind of science fiction version of what it means to perceive new and emergent realities. There can be an existing occurring reality, and I would definitely invite all present today to consider that there are occurring realities, or there are and is an occurring world, that of which we don't perceive as the same from one individual to the next, and that of which is constrained by a large data set of reference points as human beings. <laughs> so we generally tend to, as I mentioned earlier on, average objects, average experiences, average people in order to sequence what we end up calling reality. And I think over the weekend to kind of see an individual who has never had contact with that level of technology go from zero to a hundred let's say, just for sake of giving a kind of, you know, value to it, um, is truly inspiring as a, another human being experiencing another human being, seeing possibility for the first time at that age, I will certainly say, is also quite moving. So I think um, we must consider that, although in this example I'm utilizing there was technology involved, technology is also not a requisite within the context of convergent reality in order for one to begin to perceive reality newly or to begin to perceive emergent realities. And the concern that I have is that there are fewer people that are interested in penetrating that of which is a constraint that would limit their perception of emergent realities than there are who are aware of that particular cognitive sequencing and that are willing to do anything to interrupt it. Yeah, well, I mean, you and I had a very uh, deep conversation <laughs> on the topic one on one, and and it sort of opened my my eyes to, to that as well. So, uh, with this unprecedented uh, merging of technologies, industries, and ideas, in in the view of the panel, um, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, to uh, effective convergence, and and how can this be addressed? Um, 
Well, I'll deal with the challenge relating to what Dominic just had uh, talked about earlier when he was wrapping up his conversation, which is um, this notion of convergence is now at a nation state level. So let's take it from that, 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 that perspective. So when nation states start to understand the value and posture around the idea of convergence as becoming primary in their objectives and policy and, and, and so on, then we understand the power right, that is being wielded from that understanding and how, uh, uh, how pivotal it can be for transforming uh, the, the, that, that state. And so from that standpoint, there are going to be those who, are, who will take it seriously and, 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 and use leverage, leverage the, the thinking behind it. And then there are going to be those who are oblivious to the reality of it. Um, and that's where the dangers uh, will, 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 will come. Uh, but in terms of uh, everyday life and, and people that are working and people that are creating solutions, everyone at their, in their role, uh, their job, wants to do a great job. Um, it's all about being able to collaborate. But beyond collaborating around information, uh, collaborating about around uh, thoughts and ideas, collaborating around the tools that, that are used in an enterprise. So a lot of times you see in companies where people, um, there's one group that's using this tool, and that's another group that's using this tool, and another group that's using a tool, and they're all using the same tool for the, uh, the s different tools for exactly the same thing. Uh, sometimes convergence needs to happen around those things, right? Um, you've got multiple sets of data representing the same thing. Um, smart convergence systems uh, take all that information and do really good attribution right, around that data. So there's a finite representation around that data that's meaningful for what the organization's purpose is. So those are some of the things that we can look out for in our everyday uh, life as we, as we do in our work. It doesn't matter what you're doing, um, but thinking around, in the, in, around those lines is always helpful. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on um, something that you had mentioned and also point to that, let's say, given the existing cognitive augmentation tools that we have, there's nothing that would effectively stop someone from maximizing on the existing system we have, the human brain, right? Um, and the utilization of that organic tool to begin this process, what I hope is that in time, we'll realize in the same way that one needs to visit the gym regularly or have some type of exercise, um, over the weekend, we are the first hackathon in the world to utilize a cognitive augmentation tool as a primer for participation in our hackathon. Our intention and my idea that brought that to fruition in conversation with our partner was how can we fulfill on our commitment to developing an environment that would allow for emergent solutions, those of which have not been discussed or crafted before in time, and those which would naturally emerge out from this environment. Well, we need to prime individuals at a cognitive level. We need to utilize something that is, in my view, non-invasive, but which has real scientific research backed and is effective. And we did have a tool that allowed people, and I tell you, um, aside from, uh, you know, a more formalized lab study, let's say, anecdotally, after people utilize this tool throughout the course of the hackathon itself, there was a young man yesterday, he used the tool, when he was done, I said, how was it? And he literally did this, it was the first time of the whole weekend, he goes, it was great. <laughs> I'd not seen him smile one single time since he arrived, and yet, Utilizing this kind of tools to begin to optimize performance, decrease stress in a manner which is non-invasive will prepare us for a future that will be far more integrative, oftentimes required in workplaces, 
increasingly required in academia and in academic environments, and subtly being introduced in our everyday lives. So my hope is that perhaps out from this event, people will actually become curious about what existing cognitive augmentation tools could I utilize to increase my capacity for perceiving new and emergent realities, and actually, you know, end of day, just in improve the quality of my life, perhaps um, utilizing a word which I think we're all familiar with is productivity, but productivity which is human-centric and allows me to actually utilize my energy, my talent, my expertise in a more focused and consolidated way that goes beyond just satisfying what I'm being required to do. So, yeah, this is, I think, a view that I have on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's great when you, when you hear that, though, right? Because most times, uh, especially now when you think about being optimal or product productive, right? That's automation, right? right. That's what, <laughs> what we're talking about. So to, to then say that the human brain can be used as uh, it, to its full potential to actually be more optimal or more mm. productive is uh, kind of goes... Um, you know, against everything that we're that we're hearing right now. Mm. As as someone who's experienced that, what did, how did you feel? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, as an artist, uh, uh, I would say that, and I I'm sure all creative people we we like focusing on on what we do best and the creative side, and not wasting our time in a way on on. Uh, creating what what today and uh, is necessary in order to promote your work so so if there are ways to uh, to optimize that uh, great and that's that's why I'm 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 here today to to learn more and and to be able to uh, to share share the good news well how, how do you think that leaders of organization organizations can cultivate and nurture uh, convergent creative uh, collaboration yeah I think that you know it really starts with a conversation of inspecting that which is already present for the conversation of convergence obviously today we have far more um, let's say uh, titles and roles that are specific to kind of traditional industrial uh, uh, frameworks and structures. I think that in very short time we will most certainly see, um, you know, chief convergent of chief convergence officers, um, chief convergence facilitators, um, that of which uh, are going to play a large role in shaping cultures of convergence and convergent create creative collaboration. In my view, you know, just to hammer once again upon this idea of cognitive augmentation. If you consider your organization today, they call for a team meeting, I think it's mostly dreary for most people. And what we're hoping and what we're looking and intending to design and create as we go forward are environments that actually begin with that augmented experience that primes us to do within that context, to do within that time and environment what actually our brains are best at doing, what humans are uniquely equipped to do, and that is be creative and collaborate with one another. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I certainly think that from a leadership point of view, let's say that yes, it includes those within the corporate sector to take the lead, to become educated, to understand, to look at other nation states as examples of what is possible. Um, but beyond that, it really should become something that is systemic across society that is being supported by policymakers, um, key stakeholders from communities, business owners, and leadership across the whole, because these are considerations that are not future looking in as much as like I'm saying this and maybe someday that will exist. It is today that the second largest, and I am avoiding really commenting directly, <laughs> but you know, Given the resources of an entire nation state, it is not to be avoided, it must be addressed. And every nation will have the responsibility of doing so. So perhaps some of the people here fall into the category or profile of a business leader, stakeholder, I would definitely encourage them to go back to their communities and just ask your employees, have you ever heard of a convergence before? Or ask your community, what is our plan in regard to this fast moving, developing accelerationism that requires a framework for us as humans to locate ourselves in reality? Yeah. Subhead shaking. Yeah, I actually couldn't express it better. 
Um, but I'll put it in more, perhaps more relatively uh, simplistic terms in terms of uh, a leader in, in, in an environment. Um, number one, the c thinking in terms of convergence is, a, is going to be a little different, right? Mm -hmm. So um, empowering the folks that are going to be leading the charge on how you uh, inject convergence into the thinking and into your organization. Uh, there has to be some deliberate steps in how those people are brought up to speed and how they communicate that value proposition into the organization. So that's one. Number two, the, 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 the types of uh, the, the people that are going to need to uh, be involved or uh, sit at the table and discuss ideas uh, and, and solutions around convergence in your organization has to be done in a very equitable way. Okay, uh, so there's a huge equity play there. The third thing I would mention is also uh, the, the notion of a North Star in terms of what your objectives are and what you are trying to achieve. Organizations go through change and a lot of times they lose their way, especially when it's a new field of study and a new field of understanding. So make sure that you always understand what your North Star is and you're tracking as, as well as possible. Uh, to that North Star. Yeah. Well, I mean, considering the pace uh, of change uh, and sheer ranges of field of industry coming together, uh, what skills uh, do we think will most benefit or, or be most valuable for professionals in the convergent future? Mia, yeah, I toss that over to you. As someone coming from the worlds of arts, you kind of pointed out earlier where artists like to focus, but if any of the exposure that you've had until now with CR has given you an insight, what kind of skills within the creative industries do you think more artists could acquire to help begin to nurture a culture of convergence or convergent reality? Mm, rather, than, rather than a skill, I would, I would just say curiosity and, and you know, uh, the ability to see possibilities uh, in new, Technologies and and new new ways uh, of of doing things mm -hmm. because sometimes it's difficult to uh, to say what what you need when you don't know what you need you know but then only after like you said this gentleman when when he when he saw and experienced something it's only after that that you realize the the true potential that that there may be for your business or mm. your art. Mm. Got it. Yeah, I'd say for me in my career, there were two major things that happened that pointed me in the direction of convergence. One was with uh, an experience I had with IBM uh, in, in my Silicon Valley days where I was working uh, with IBM on a very huge content management uh, project. They had over, uh, it, was a, it was about four or five different teams uh, globally that we're working on this um, on this system and my initial impression was for the the, the, the type of solutions that we were, we were de delivering through this content management system it was really uh, a lot of number one a lot of people that were uh, globally that were not having the same conversation around the the processes and tasks and things that needed to be done uh, on a weekly basis uh, so that number one getting the right people at the table, regardless of uh, what their role was. It was occurring to me that we were having extremely disconnected conversations the whole time. There were the people that were working on the data, there were pe the people that were working on the website, there were people that were working on making decisions about testing and quality and, and, and so on. And there were people that were just focused on content and nobody was really talking. So the notion of getting folks to the table that are typically not at the table uh, became very, very important to me in my mind because inevitably everybody knew something about everything, but nobody knew everything about, you know. So when you do that, the knowledge about everything comes together. And so if you have a technical problem, uh, the, the likelihood of solving it faster is when you have more people at the table that can uh, ch uh, chime into uh, what their experience has been from their perspective. So no hard rules there in terms of who needs to be at the table. You just need more different people at the table. Yeah, well, I'm gonna open, I have one final question, but I'm gonna open it to, to, to a Q&A first. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Can I say one skill that I think? Yeah, is absolutely. Useful? I'm sorry you looked at me like we were ready to move on. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please. So I'm going to invite everyone to consider that what we discussed earlier, that of which is effectively how humans sequence and create their reality, becomes very staid in a way. Yeah, it becomes the average of everything. And over the course of the weekend, I invited the participants to consider a notion, and it came from a Chinese idiom, which is really just four characters, but within four characters, there are universes, I would say, of consideration. And that idiom effectively is a frog at the bottom of a well. I asked the participants to consider a frog at the bottom of a well for one minute. And in our fast moving world of accelerationism, that one minute occurred to them like an eon. <laughs> Aside from that, when I asked, what was it that emerged for you whilst you were considering the frog at the bottom of the well? And the first person that I asked is a software developer. And he said, well, I immediately started trying to solve the problem for the frog being at the bottom of the well. I said, oh, that's very interesting. What was the instruction? Consider the frog at the bottom of a well. I said, oh, that's interesting. So does this reflect how you approach the world or how the world occurs for you? And he said, actually, yes. I'm always trying to solve a problem even when there's not one. And I said, does that constrain you? Are you able to see outside of looking up from the bottom of the well that there's anything other than that in your world? So he started to get it. Next person, who I think is actually here tonight, I asked. And his consideration was he thought perhaps that the frog was experiencing pain because he was stuck at the bottom of the well. I said, that's interesting. What was the instruction? Consider the frog at the bottom of the well. <laughs> And then he said, but then I quickly moved toward, well, maybe the frog is happy at the bottom of the well. I said, yes, but that's also not the instruction. Just consider the frog. So what I'm getting to is we're all the frog at the bottom of the well, looking up at that hole, thinking that that is the world. So in the story of the frog and the well, along comes a turtle. And it kind of varies between animals, whichever culture you're going through uh, across Asia Pacific. But let's say it's a turtle. And the turtle says, hey, don't you think we should go see the sea? And the frog says, but here is paradise. <laughs> and that's it. There's no explanation. There's no moral. There's nothing. There's just a consideration of, and this is kind of an activity that can be done through language to consider with your teams or with your spouse if you really want to annoy them, um, consider a frog at the bottom of a well and see what emerges. Because in that very short exercise in idiom, we start to see how we're constrained by reference, how we're constrained by the limitations of how we see the world, which therefore doesn't even begin to allow us the possibility of experiencing or perceiving new and emergent realities. How are we supposed to be as a company competing with entire nation states that get it. How are we supposed to, as communities, as individuals, be able to evolve from that? And it really requires a very intentional intellectual effort to start to imagine that there's anything outside the top of the well. <laughs> that's, a, that's a skill I give you. I, I was trying to help the frog out. <laughs> so I feel personally attacked. No. <laughs> okay, if there, is there any questions in the audience? Yep. How do you actually bring in the collective cognitive world like to foster everyone into this new reality? You know, uh, like, uh, is there any incentive for academia? or the polity, or the, like the trade, because sure. always, um, you know, technology leads the, I mean, it's always supersedes the regulations and other things. How do you bring the reality 
and like you know what is an incentive so people will move into this out of the well so yeah. instead of looking at the world yeah i can quickly answer just from the point of view of paul savage who's a professor over at alto university his participation has been very interesting because in the early days before convergent reality was even a company i shared with him what we were working on and he authored a short summary submitted it to a conference in Greece and they selected him to author an actual paper. So there was an incentive for him as an academia community member to actually produce some consolidated thoughts about the area, yeah? And what I'm, what I'm getting to is uh, that the incentive for um, these types of organizations, let's say community members, even throughout academia, um, and specifically for Paul, why I shared him was that he is trying right now to locate himself as an educator, as a teacher in a world that is saying, as a result of this quick solution, this large language model for lack of, of better avoiding the name itself, um, where does education stand? We have a disparate, we have a disparate view on this. There's universities that ban it. There's schools that encourage it. There's people that have stood on this stage and emphatically said, if your child is not learning how to use prompts, then your child would be left behind. But you know, um, I don't really think that's necessarily true. I mean, I think similar things were said about calculators, computers, and so on. And yet, um, let's put a ribbon on this, otherwise I'll go on for a very long time. But I think that from my point of view, the incentive for people to begin to involve themselves in the conversation of convergence is first and foremost, locating themselves as a human within the fast moving world of accelerationism. If we can do that, actually step away from it for a moment, we might get a new view and be able to perceive it newly, thus we not give up our agency as human beings. So I think that's what I'll say to that. I, I honestly couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm, I'm aligned with, with that notion. Yes, accelerationism uh, is happening. And um, as these technologies that are evolving so quickly uh, in, 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 in the world right now because of LLMs and AI, uh, it, it, they're creating new opportunities for learning to accelerate. That's the reality of it. And so um, once you understand the posture of being, of accepting that reality uh, and tooling yourself as a person, regardless of what you do, uh, um, the fact is these things are going to get better. And understanding at this elementary age how to leverage them as tools. Uh, and as they get better, you're able to leverage them better. And uh, that's really where things are going. Um, it's, it's not going to change. So it's better that we posture ourselves properly and align with the learnings that we can get from them. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for, for one more. Um, straight back. Michael. Yes, hi, this is uh, Michael, as introduced, and uh, I was the one uh, who initially asking uh, Dominique about uh, virtual reality, extended reality. But then I would like to focus more on the convergent definition in the term. I mean, myself, I'm coming from the telecommunication, and maybe everybody can agree on one of the best usage of the word convergent, which was the convergence in uh, communications. 20 years ago, we had separate networks for voice, separate networks for data, for sending pictures, for sending television signal and video. And the conversion was worth in the communication to unify all these networks into a single network that we now know as the internet. Actually being able to use the same media to share your pictures, video voices and, and everything. And this showed one of the topics that I'm curious if this is really the case because Nobody's using now just a circuit switch telephone network, and nobody's using ATM just to send uh, videos, and nobody's using a pure TV signal network. So why do we want to have a convergent reality? Why do we think that there will be one reality to rule them all, and only one for everybody to use? Is this even good one? Because convergent in that case means to go to a single 
a solution to a problem. This is what we are taught in schools, right? This is the convergence in all the lessons that there is always one answer to the question. There is or, or multiple choices, but there is finite choices of question. There is only one reality. Is this really what uh, we are preaching now from the stage? I mean, sorry, a bit provocative, but maybe. Well, I think it's a clearly misunderstood in a sense, and also an individual interpretation. So from the bottom of the well that you sit, you see it perhaps, or at least this is what I'm getting, right? So I'm just trying to give back what I got from you. The manner in which you see it is that we are proposing that convergent reality is a singular reality that should apply to all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Convergent reality is that which emerges from an individualistic perception of the occurring world. And what we're looking to nurture, what we're looking to encourage is the ability for people to actually move away from that consolidated version or that homogeneous version toward that of which will allow them to perceive the world from their individualistic point of view, rather than moving in the direction which you were pointing toward, which is more that homogeny, right? I don't know. Well, because I'm a technician, I think I can answer your, 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 your question a little differently, right? So right now, you're right. We went back in, in the telecom days, you had different types of networks, right? You had circuit switch, you had pods and so on. Uh, but, and then the internet came. But think about virtualization, right? So right now on a virtualized network, you can still have all those legacy technologies, right? You can have point to point, you can run FTP, you can run FTP, you can run different types of network uh, protocols. Right, you have IP and, you know, and so on, running through the same pipe, uh, so to speak. But that's the new pipe that everyone uses, right? And so it represents a converged network that virtualizes all the old technologies, which still work today, uh, with along with the new technologies, which are always being advanced. So now you've got, you know, um, you've got uh, G3, G4, G5, G6, and so on all running through the same pipe. Universal global pipe that everyone has access to. So that's probably the best way I could answer that question. And maybe just to say also that there's a distinction with the process of convergence. Convergence doesn't occur from, uh, let's say, a nowhere. It occurs and then as convergence also leads to future convergence doesn't mean that we have an iterative of convergence, convergence, convergence. In fact, the activity is convergence, divergence, convergence, divergence, convergence, divergence. And so certainly we can find across various sectors examples of this and across society various, various um, examples of this. But what I would say is we are looking to encourage and design those systems and environments that will allow for an individualistic distinction of that occurring reality for that individual and eventually moving beyond organics. There is the matter of conversation that we're having with the professor regarding the de-objectification of objects. So there will also come a divergence from the conversion notion that all that which is not human or organic is therefore objectified, if that makes sense. And I don't know if that answered your question, but Michael, I'm happy to talk with you more and explore that together later, because I think it's a great question. Thank you for that. Hey, so I, I did have one more question, but in the, in the interest of time, I won't, I won't ask it. I'll, I'll ask in, individually, because I know that a huge portion of, of today uh, is about networking and, and talking more about mm. this one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So let's give our uh, panelists a huge, huge round of applause. Thank you all so much, so much uh, for being here today. Um, yeah, you know, as I, as I mentioned, uh, we're a community uh, of, of brilliant people who come together to share ideas and, and to grow. And uh, this was a fantastic conversation of which I hope that we talk about a little bit more uh, in the upcoming future. So uh, there will be snacks. The bar is open. And uh, as again, I'm, I'm Joey. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.